black on black violence, like gang violence, for example. Why don't people talk? Reach Vintage. You gotta say it in a super German like way. Also dry. Also very dry. It's a five to ding 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 ding. We can do that, we're Asian. Send your complaints at geography later at gmail. It's not like that. Come on, it's not like that. It has nothing to do with actual black people saying you don't qualify to be black. That's how you divide a group, a population, to keep them in line. Mambo, naito mengi natoka Kenya. Hello guys, my name is Mangi. I'm from Kenya. So today guys, I'm here to do a reaction to geography na Namibia. Namibia. Namibia, Namibia, Namibia. Namibia is a country in Southern Africa. And we're gonna dive in to all of what Namibia is. But first, guys, like, like, like the video, subscribe to the channel, click on the bell notification that you get notified whenever I release a new video. I am trying to... Oh, also, follow, follow, follow me on Instagram. Really, follow, follow, follow me on Instagram. People do, you guys do, uh, keep following and all that, keep making suggestions, feel free. I, I, I talk to people, like ask, I don't think there's anyone who is my subscriber that has texted me that I have not, you know, listened to. Oh, Swahili word for today, the Swahili word. I'm from Kenya, right? We're, we're East Africans, Namibia is in Southern Africa. East Africans, most of us speak Swahili. I'm talking about East Africa, East African community. Most of us speak the Swahili language. You guys might have heard it in the show my Josie song, John Cena, or a bunch of her other songs. She lived in East Africa for a bit and learned our language. And so I, every, in, every, in every one of my videos, I do a Swahili word. So, so the Swahili word for today is Jangwa. Jangwa means desert. Why Jangwa? Because Namibia is a very, very, it's actually arid right by the coast. There is a skeleton, the skeleton coast. And all. The Jangwa is desert, if you guys did not know. Moving on. Now, what do we know about Namibia? Namibia. I know that the capital is Vinduk. Vinduk? I think it's the place of winds or something. Is it? Is it? Like, it's it's from German though. Uh, Namibia was formerly a German colony. And during that time, uh, very many atrocities happened. The first genocide of the 20th century happened in Namibia, actually. And very few people recognized it. It was the Herero and Namako genocide where lots of people, very many, very many people were killed. And it's an unfortunate event that many people actually don't even know about on most of the continent. I found out about this because I was researching about the Holocaust. In places like Luderitz uh, and all that, I know that people, there were camps to literally exterminate the native population within Namibia. Hmm. No more dark stuff. I know about Swapo and their liberation movement. I know that in you no know, the Kenya government sort of helped Swapo just a bit, not 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 too much. I know that Namibia was also part of like South Africa, still under apartheid system. Oh yeah, apartheid also happened in Namibia. For those guys who did not know, it's just that nobody ever remembers it being in that way. That's why you'll find like a lot of the land in Namibia is actually still white owned. And it's controversial. It's not really controversial, but then it's the only major population centers are Vinduk, Sako, Moon, uh, and all of that. I do not know. Oh, there are Bantus in the north where the land is the most fertile, but then I don't know about the rest of the country. It's a Koi, Koi, and San people who inhabit other parts of the country and yeah is it wind because it's windy i don't remember exactly but there was wind corner yeah i'm sure the locals had a name for this place but i just don't know yeah see ojo muise in hochi herero in herero it's ojo muise the locals have all kinds of names for all these places i'm gonna start playing the video in three two one many of you guys Namibian geography have told me that if you want to make the shape of Namibia on your hand, just curl your index finger, stick out your thumb, and go like this. That's not some kind of gang sign, is it? Uh, let me check. Bloods, Crips, Kings, MS-13, Sudanios, Couple Crips. No, I think we're good. I, uh, went to a public school in Chicago. Ah. It's time to learn geography. Oh, okay. So why did he mention Chicago? Chicago is known for its gun, its gang violence and... All that stuff, it's not, yeah. Hey everyone, I'm your host Barbs. Ah, Namibia, South Africa. And like, when the, you know, I don't want to get all political, but then when the right wing in the US talks about 
when you talk about Black Lives Matter, uh, mostly on the left and in the center, sometimes in the center, people talk about, oh, what about black uh, gang, black on black violence, like gang violence, for example? Why don't people talk about that? And um, yeah, anyways, I won't dive into that. Because American politics, y'all. Ex-wife, but now getting back together and dating again. Girlfriend who speaks German, kind of, and has unexplained polka dots. Yeah, Africa, love this place. You'll never be bored with this continent. Let's find Namibia on the map now, shall we? <laughs> Namibia is known for being one of the safest and cleanest places to visit in all of Africa. Not the cheapest, but you can still kind of get by and get lost in the maze of open space. How much open space? A lot. Let's take a look at the map now, shall we? First of all, Namibia is located in southern Africa with a long coast along the Atlantic. It looks like they're only bordered by Angola, Botswana, and South Africa, but if you look over here, they have this long panhandle known as the Caprivi Strip. And at the very end of it, they share a river border with Zambia and Zimbabwe as well, making it the world's only quadra point between sovereign nations. You talked about it in the Botswana episode, right? Yes, I did. Watch it again, guys. The country is divided into 14 regions with the capital and largest city, Vintuk, nestled in the central Comas region. Vintuk. You gotta say it in a super German-like way. Yeah. It also has the country's largest and only international airport, Vintuk's Hosea Kutako International. After Vintuk, the next largest cities are Rundu in the northeast and Walvis Bay, which holds one of the two main shipping ports, Walvis Bay Harbor. Actually, Walvis Bay is the second largest city, right? Did I say Swakopmund? Which is the only natural harbor in the country divided by the Pelican Point Sand Spit, which holds these cool salt work evaporation fields. And then there's the smaller Luderitz Harbor further south. Each of these port cities are the final coastal stops for the largest rail network run by the National Train Service, Trans... Oh, yeah. Okay. They're right next to each other. Nabib. It traverses the entire country going into Angola and South Africa with proposed future lines that will enter into Botswana. Otherwise, Namibia has quite a unique civil structure because it's huge but with only about three people per square kilometer. So like, I could totally bury some treasure over there and like, nobody would find it? Yeah, but don't sail on the north coast. You could die. The Portuguese called it the gates to hell. The Bushmen called it the land god made in anger. But today, it's commonly known as the skeleton coast. This strange geological phenomena in which colossal orange desert sand dunes converge right into the ocean, where you can find tons of shipwrecked vessels of ill-prepared seafarers. An ocean of sand meets like an ocean of water? That was beautifully illustrated, Keith. On top of that, there are quite a few notable places of interest that you might want to consider checking out if you come, such as Kolmenskop Ghost Town, Sanderberg Castle, the Hoba Meteorite, the largest meteorite in the world, the sand dunes of Susasvle, the Gibeon Meteorites, the Solitaire Installation, the dinosaur footprints of this farm, the Tropic of Capricorn Crossing, Christ Kurke, the Cheetah Conservation Fund, Crocodile Ranch, the Umbalantu Baobab Tree, the Twufafontaine Rock Carvings, Independence Memorial Museum, and Heroes Acre. Whew, yeah, lots of space and lots of cool sites, especially the natural ones. Which brings us to... Now, Namibia is quite a dry country. How dry is it? The driest nation in Sub-Saharan Africa. But Namibia isn't all sand and desert. There's quite a bit of lush vegetation too. You just have to know where to find it. First of in all, the, the country is generally divided... In the north, it's greener. In the south, it's drier. In the coast, it's also dry. Also very dry into five different geographic areas. Along the coast and north, you have the oldest desert in the world, the Namib Desert, which is where the skeleton coast that we talked about lies. Just west, you have the Central Plateau, a dry region where the tallest peak in the country lies, Brandenburg Mountain, with Kungenstein Peak at over 2,500 meters high. This is also where most of the population lives and where you can find most of the arable land. In the south, there's the Great Escarpment, a hilly, rocky shrubland with the longest river in the country, the Fish River, which also has the Fish River Canyon, the largest canyon in Africa. In the northeast and the Caprivi Strip, you have the Bushveld, the greenest and lushest part of Namibia, with the savanna and forests that extend all the way to the Okavango Delta and Zambezi River. It is also here where you can find the famous Etosha Pan. At over 120 kilometers long, it is one of the largest salt flats in the world. Hey, I have one of those. Let's hang out sometime. The largest natural lake in the country, though, is this tiny little guy, only about 6,600 square meters, Lake Guinness, which is actually a sinkhole lake caused by a collapsed cave. Finally, we reach the world-renowned Kalahari Desert in the east, famous for being a strange place with unique plant and wildlife species, since it kind of gets more rain than most other deserts. Also, fun side note, in the Namib Desert, there's a strange natural phenomena known as fairy circles. Fairy circles are a strange natural phenomena only found in dry regions of Africa and Australia. They're 
grass naturally grows in a circle pattern with an empty dirt or sand pit in the middle. Scientists have theories as to why this happened, but so far the exact explanation still remains shrouded in enigma. Noah takes over the rest of the segment! Did somebody say... Noah. Namibia is unique in that despite much of the country being dry, it's not completely inhospitable. Over 200 species of mammals, like the national animal, the oryx, can be found, as well as over 600 species of birds and over 4 300 plants, at least 700 of which are endemic. Much of their industries are centered around production of resources like meat, fish, minerals, and diamonds. Especially diamonds, they're one of the top 10 producers. Nobody beats the Russia in diamonds. And speaking of resources, Boom! First off, from what we were told, Namibians love meat. And when the meat-loving Germans came in, well, let's just say it wasn't too hard to agree on something. Look, we hated your colonial rule, but we really dig the bratwurst, schnitzel, and what is that crazy thing you do with the whole pig? Oh, you mean the Spanfakel? Yes! Man, you guys are so crazy! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was weird, okay. Some dishes you guys, the Namibian jogger peeps suggest we mentioned might include things like Capana, silver cod, and luderitz crayfish, fat cakes, poppin' flakes, wapane worms, poiki, kalahari truffles, and those gigantic omojoa mushrooms. The national drink Oshikindu, and everywhere you can find the Namibian style game barbecue known as Bri, featuring legally hunted animals like kudu, springbok zebra. So you'll notice that in Southern Africa, they are very. because of, because of apartheid and that German colonial influence. They don't call the meats, they don't call whatever, uh, they call it all braai. They call it braai, whether you're in South Africa, Namibia, I think to some extent, even in London, places like Zimbabwe. Anyways, moving forward. Bruh and crocodile. And speaking of which, you'll find that the people of Namibia, much like the diverse set of animals, come from a myriad of colorful traditions and customs. Which brings us to... <laughs> Namibia has about 2.7 million people and is the second least densely populated sovereign nation in the world after Mongolia. The country has quite a few people groups, but the largest group, about half of the population, being Ovambo, followed by the Kavango at 9%. Mixed people of all types make up about 8%. The Herero and Damara each take up about 7% each, and the rest are various other people groups that we'll discuss later. During the scramble for Africa in the late 1800s, the area of what is now Namibia fell under German rule for about 30 years. It got kind of messy, there was a genocide, we'll talk about that later, until finally South African forces took over in 1915. Anyway, the thing is, despite Germany having a short presence in the area, their legacy still kind of clung on and lives on to this day. And you've seen things like road signs, buildings, there's even some German radio stations and a newspaper, so yeah. Nonetheless, only about 2-3% to of the population actually speaks it natively, mostly the white German population. However, it is taught in many schools and used as a commercial language. Up until 1990, it was actually a co-official language with English and Afrikaans. Faith-wise, most Namibians at least nominally identify as Christian, somewhere at 80-90%. to 90%, mostly belonging to Protestant branches, especially the largest one being Lutheran. It was brought over from German and surprisingly Finnish missionaries. Basically, it can be broken down into four family categories. The Bantu, the Khoisan, the Mixed, and the Whites. Let's go over some of them, shall we? In a nutshell, the Khoisan groups in Namibia, like the Nama, the San, and the Kung, are kind of like the original inhabitants. Yes, that little exclamation mark is a click sound, and I'm not even joking, it's a real people group. They are one of the oldest cultures in the world, dating back to the Stone Age, famous for having various techniques that have helped them develop into the harsh climates. They're also famous for their distinguishing features. They are some of the only black people in the world that have natural epicanthic folds on their eyes from birth, similar to East Asians. Epic what? Epicanthic fold. Yeah, that's like the medical term for those, the eyes, you know, the, the, the ding, 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 ding. We can do that. We're Asian. Send your complaints at geography later at gmail. <laughs> in addition, they are known for being the originators of the click languages. You know, the ones with the, uh, Sounds. Later on, other Bantu groups migrated from West Africa around 1000 BC and they would adopt these sounds into their languages like Zulu or Kosa. But Khoisan is kind of the one that started it all. You know that language they speak in Black Panther? The Wakandan language? You know it's actually the Kosa language from South Africa? It's so original and unique. Thank goodness there's such an original click language like Kosa. No, it's not like that. Come on, it's not like that. Geography, no. Why you gotta start so? Much? Why you gotta start so much stuff? Okay, I will explain this in the simplest way possible. You, you are a colonizer, right? You want to identify yourself with bringing civilization to a part of the world. What do you do? You justify invading a foreign land. Not in your continent, 
by saying, do you see, Bantus migrated from here, they also invaded your lands. And up until today, it's an issue. Khoisan and all these groups, sometimes they don't even identify as being black. Okay, sometimes they don't identify as being black because of this. To justify what they did to try and invade the continent, you will see, even in Southern Africa, that's why you have black people that are colored. You have people like Trevor Noah. In South Africa, do you know people, t people would put him in a classification saying he's not black? And it's because of apartheid. It has nothing to do with actual black people saying you don't qualify to be black. That's the truth. And that's what happens in, uh, in Southern Africa. So when, you exp when this is explained from different perspectives, really, it becomes so controversial. And that's why sometimes I get mad. Anyway, moving on. Oh, they did that to also justify their taking over of foreign lands. Uh, so, apartheid wasn't some bad thing people did. Apartheid is some, um, uh, we just did it because, you know, p f first we are Christian. We are, you know, we are the more civilized people. So we're not mass murdering people. Then what were they doing? How did black people all of a sudden disappear from the Western and Northern Cape in Southern Africa? How did they all disappear? Did that just happen just magically? There were no black people there? You know, they told, they literally forced people off their land. Do you know why land redivision is such a controversial issue? Because it was land that was literally taken away from people and people then bought it, bought it, bought it in generations but then just it's just the whites that were buying it. So giving it back to people is an issue. But should it be given back or not? Whose land is it? And land is a way to generate wealth. Land is about multi-generation wealth. That's why. Even in America, the people who started out, they used to get parcels of land. We used to learn about this. I took US history. They used to get parcels of land from the federal government. To, so that they could settle out west or even in the, in the east. That's how it's like. Land generates wealth. You take, people, you take people's land, their cattle, what happens? That's why. That's the truth. Because I'm so mad at geography now for not explaining some of this stuff correctly. Even in the South Africa episode, he brings a person who is clearly so biased. In terms of explaining one thing, she starts explaining about how, what was that part? Uh, how it was the Bantus that migrated. She has to make that point. Do you know why she has to overemphasize that the Bantus migrated there? So that they could also justify. Because that's the kind of like the thing that was used to justify the fact that other people from another continent moved into the place and then start displacing people. That's how they justify it. Uh, it's, a, it's a justification platform for some of the stuff that's happened. And that's the truth. So sometimes I, I, I watch these videos and I get really mad. Explain both sides. At least explain both sides to it. Don't listen to just one side and then just say blah, blah, blah. Anyway. Just let it go. Now let's talk about the Bantu groups. The largest Bantu group, known as the Ovambo or Ovambo, are people that are found mostly in the north along the border with Angola. They love wearing the color fuchsia and they have this really cool fruit harvest festival. The Kavango and Lozi people live mostly in the lush greener panhandle areas by the Caprivi Strip. They are famous for their woodwork and have an interesting king and queen boat ceremony. The Herrero people mostly live in the central and eastern parts of the country. They are famous for their colorful Victorian style gowns inspired by German and Finnish missionaries who settled there. In addition, the cousins of the Herrero people, the Himba up north, are probably the most isolated group that maintains their traditional way of life. They're famous for using ojize paste made out of butterfat and ochre used as a sunscreen that they put on their skin and hair to protect against the sun and heat. According to tradition, the Damara people, possibly the oldest Bantu group in Namibia, were enslaved by the click-speaking Nama people and adopted their language, even though they are Bantu. You see a lot of Khoisan influence in them, like animal skin clothing and hunting techniques. And after the Bantu and Khoisan groups, you have the mixed peoples like the Colors, the Orlans, the Bastards. So that's why even in Namibia and South Africa, you have this weird racial category called colored. Trevor Noah 
Trevor Noah, if you guys watch uh, Trevor, the Trevor Noah show, you will notice he will talk about this. He will talk about how his parents weren't even allowed to have him. They weren't even supposed to be together because of racial laws. So when black and white people mix, they did not create other black kids in South Africa, not like the US. They created colored people, right? And then in that colored group, you also include people who are Malay, like the Malaysian Malay. So in that weird racial category, you have so many people groups that are not even from the same culture. It's like, what? Because that's how you divide a group, a population to keep them in line. To this day, colored people and black people in South Africa and Southern Africa have issues. Uh, they do. They really do. Because even during apartheid, colored people sort of had a few more rights. A few more things that were better. Uh, anyways. What you say? I know, I know. It sounds bad, but that's literally what they call themselves. These are the people that have both... Colored is such an offensive term, but it was still used in Southern Africa to this day. And th this is the same group that honestly still justifies what they were doing, displacing people, by saying Bantus migrated to this, and then they displaced a bunch of people. They don't say that in, in a way I would say. I know Bantus migrated to parts of other parts of Africa. Yes, they displace people. Yes, but you do not use it as justification for some of this stuff. You do not. European and African ancestry to varying degrees. They even developed their own communities and traditions, much like those in South. History, in the quickest way I can condense it. Khoisan groups, Bantu migration. This Portuguese dude stops by, but he doesn't really care. Orlam people cross over in the 1800s. They make peace with the Nama people. Nama Herrera war. Germany comes in. It becomes German Southwest Africa. The two groups that fought each other are now joining up and they fight the Germans. The first genocide of the 20th century. 1915, South Africa takes over. Weird police zones and confining people groups to certain territories a separatist group starts and rebels thinking about an independent state or as i like to call it no nah, maybe uh <laughs> Independence from South Africa in 1990. Multi-party democracy introduced. Caprivi strip tries to secede, but Namibia is like, oh no. Probably, probably the closest friend to South Africa. The language, the culture, uh, the history of the apartheid, all of that. If Africa was a family, Namibia would kind of be like this straight B student. You know, they kind of coast by comfortably and keep things chill and everyone just kind of gets along with them. For Germany, things are generally amicable as Namibia has had the highest concentration of Germans in Africa for a while. Tourists love coming. They give them lots of it. Okay, I will say the truth. Now, the other day, the German government offered reparations for what happened within Namibia. And we want trillions to heal our wounds. The German government offered reparations for what they did so are unimpressed so also don't take everybody's individual word for what like i'm saying these geography geography now guys they seriously need to look into some of this stuff. Cuba was a major player that helped them during apartheid and independence years, and to this day, they still help with scholarships and medical support. As a member of the SADC, they generally get along with all their neighbors. Tanzania, Rwanda, and Burundi kind of wink their eyes as they pass by, since they were also under the Germans as East Africa during occupation years. However, every single Namibian I have talked to has told me that their best friends would probably be Botswana and South Africa. Mm. Botswana is kind of like the slightly richer sister that always tags along for the adventures. The two share much culturally, especially especially in the Khoisan people groups found in the Kalahari Desert that they both share. Trade and business is also huge between them. South Africa, though, is kind of like the husband they divorced but then started to date again. The two are inseparable. Now uh, these guys should really do their research and some of this history that they that they say. Um, I'm not saying that, like, it's like some of these countries in Africa do not get along. I'm not that. I'm not some far-right conspiracy theorist. I'm just saying they should get their facts right so that they do not lead, they do not misinform people so much about such sensitive topics. But now people should know. People say Bantus migrated and yes they did migrate and did displace people but they do say it to justify stuff like apartheid. So be careful about what, how you say and how it's portrayed 
within certain contexts. And either way, the Bantus did adopt some of their languages. So it's not like the Bantus invaded some of these places and they did not intermarry with these people. But then compare that to some of the apartheid level stuff. Racial separation, racial classification, and all that stuff. You guys have seen my reaction and all that. That's it. Asante sana. It's how we say thank you in East Africa, in Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, uh, Congo. Actually, no, not Uganda. So So like I could totally bury some treasure over there and like nobody would If you guys watch uh Trevor the Trevor Noah show you will notice they seriously need to look into some of this stuff. They call it Rye, whether you're in 